Hello, I'm Richard Woodruff, the city manager for the city of Jacksonville, and welcome to A Moment with the Manager. Today, it's my pleasure to bring two folks who are experts relative to hurricane preparation to our, to our program. First, the chief of the public safety department, Mike Inero, and the chief of the fire department, Spencer Lee. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you know, you. when we talk about uh, hurricane preparedness, I think back as a young boy that hurricanes were primarily in the Atlantic and the typhoons were in the Pacific. And of course, today with all the technology and all of the work that everybody does, it has now become one operation. The other thing, Spencer, I find interesting is that as a young child, all of the hurricanes were named for women. And I guess because we need to make sure that uh, we give equal rights to men and women, we now name them both for men and women. Yeah, they're looking for political correctness. Uh, they are indeed. Uh, Spencer, you're not only the fire chief for the city, but you're also the director of our emergency management program. So let's begin by talking, when we talk about the EOC, mm -hmm. what is the difference between the county EOC and the city EOC? Okay, our county EOC is responsible for emergency operations, coordinating emergency operations for the entire county, where the city EOC is responsible for coordinating the emergency operations within the city. And so we actually are part of the county EOC? Yes, we do have a liaison at the county EOC. Now, when it comes to the hurricane season, uh, obviously June through November is now the season, which basically means roughly half of our calendar year, we're technically under the hurricane watch or the hurricane program. Yes. When you talk about that and you look at the impacts that it has on North Carolina and specifically the Jacksonville area, Many people who come here from places other like Texas or even California, as our young Marines and their families come here, this is a new phenomenon to them. They're, they're used to earthquakes in California. They're used to tornadoes in Texas, but hurricanes. What's a typical uh, way to explain to someone what a hurricane is? Uh, basically, a hurricane is just a collection of thunderstorms, uh, and it's a very broad, very massive storm, and they can be up to upwards of 600 miles in diameter. Wow. Uh, so, and they and they move relatively slow compared to, for example, a uh, tornado. Uh, so they can be predicted easier. Uh, of course, you know, it's exactly what it is: is a prediction. It's just a um, use of. Uh, bunch of probabilities that the meteorologists have collected over the years of research uh, so they can kind of predict where the storm's going. Earthquakes are, uh, they, they, they can somewhat predict them, but they usually kind of strike without warning. Well now, about two years ago here in Jacksonville, we actually felt a little bit of an earthquake, even though it's not typical. And occasionally we do have a tornado like the one that hit here a couple of years ago. But hurricanes are our primary uh, issue when it comes to bad weather. When you talk about the hurricane activities, the National Weather Service has established a range of categories. Uh, Mike, can you walk us through some of the information about the sizes and the classes of hurricanes? Well, I think we have a slide about that, and we talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, typically, what we've seen over the last several years is between one and two. Um, and even, even a hurricane that some people don't even, even a tropical storm can cause us some issues, some flooding issues. So when we start to see these, form, these storms form, even if, even if they're not really a hurricane at that time, we start preparing, especially um, with the advance in, in weather technology, we can see those way out into the ocean and it'll give us some time to look at it and to start to prepare because you know, our primary purpose in preparing in, in everything that we do is to make sure that our citizens are safe. So we start discussing those things very early on, making sure that we're prepared for flooding, making sure we're prepared for high winds, making sure that we're prepared for that major hurricane, even if it's a Hurricane 5 like happened in Katrina or, um, or other places. We're going to prepare for that because, you know, just like in Katrina, when it went over Florida, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a category five, it was a category three. And then when it reached New Orleans, it, it, had, it had increased the speed of, of it and, and really devastated that area. So 
when we start thinking about the hurricane, even if it's a hurricane one, we'll start preparing for hurricane five so that, we're, that we are adequately prepared. Well, you know, we all have a tendency to think that the major storm, if it's a four or a five, it's something that's going to cause a lot of uh, damage. And to a degree, that could be true. I know growing up in Florida, we did have some category fours and fives that did cause a lot of damage, but they were relatively small storms. Now, Spencer, you mentioned a hurricane with a breadth of over 600 miles. Yes. We just looked back a short time in American history to the Sandy Storm. Yes. Uh, if my memory is correct, that was not even a Category 3. It was more of a Category 2. Is that right? Actually, when it made landfall in uh, New Jersey, New York area, it was a Category 1 hurricane. Well, if it was just a Category 1, why did it cause so much damage there? That's a good question. The, uh, the hurricanes, one of the prominent threats with hurricanes is flooding. Uh, both flooding from the rainfall that comes from the hurricane, because like I said, it's a collection of thunderstorms, so there's a massive amount of rainfall that comes from them. But also, as the storms approach from the coast, from the, from the ocean to, towards the coast, uh, in front of it pushes a lot of water. And, uh, and that's, called, that's referred to as a storm surge. The storm surge is increased in its height and magnitude by the category of hurricane. So the higher the category of hurricane, the higher the wind speeds, the more the, the flooding, the, more, the worse the storm surge is. But uh, one of the, the issues with Hurricane Sandy was it was not a, a major storm, but it caused catastrophic damage because it came in and made landfall on a lunar high tide. So the water the water was already really high. The coastal water lines were already really high, and then it brought in a you know a, a eight foot storm surge on top of that. So that was uh, it. Really caused a lot of devastation, a lot of flooding. Well, you know, Mike, we are in a way we're like New York City as far as we are a waterfront community. So when you think of the water coming in with the storm surge on a high tide. Uh, a lot of folks in Jacksonville think that we are significantly away from the coast, you know, being inland some 20, 25 miles. But from the standpoint of water and flooding, what are some of the areas around the community that are prone to flooding? Well, I mean, all you have to do is just drive downtown, for example. If you drive downtown, you can see the water there. Uh, you can see the New River. You can see the New River come up through the city. Same with Northeast Creek. You can see it uh, as we drive down 24. So those areas are prone to flooding. And you know, driving your car through there, that's where, that's where we get a lot of problems. You know, when we need to talk a little bit later on about the curfew. But sometimes the curfew is not necessarily the, the, the storm as much as it is the conditions that surround the storm mm -hmm. and that flooding that occurs. Because a lot of people drowned in their cars or trying to get drive through the water, trying to leave, not leave their car. They get stuck in the car and, and drown. So we want to be extremely careful, and that's why we do a lot of times. That's why we, we have a certain time period. And even though the sun may come out, we'll still be under the curfew because we're waiting for the water to reside, and we're also waiting to open the, the roadways. So there is a real danger of flooding. Um, we, we maintain a flooding map, and we, we, we watch those areas very, very carefully because if we start to have floods, we try to block off those roads. And a lot of times, I, you know, I'm amazed that people will actually drive around the barricades and drive through the water. And, and if your car gets that water up into the intake, it does significant damage. It will damage the motor. So a lot of times we'll put those up, and it may not look like a lot of water, but because the road may dip down or there's... Uh, there's potholes or something similar to that, you know, there's that, there's that danger that you could significantly damage your car. So if we put the barricades up, don't drive around them. Absolutely. Well, and, and the other part is that uh, while a pickup truck like mine has some pretty good clearance, cars are becoming smaller and smaller today. That means they're also lighter. Exactly. More and I remember way. reading that it only takes two inches of water to actually cause a car to lose traction. Mm -hmm. yep. And in moving water, it could actually float you into another car, float you off the road, float you into a ditch, or worse, it could actually float you into very deep water and, and cause a problem. Now, Spencer, part of the, of the benefit of being a United States citizen is we have tremendous resources available. Absolutely. We know when a storm comes off of the uh, coast of Africa what it looks like weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. 
What are the type of things, though, and when do we begin to do our pre-planning, not just for the hurricane season, but for a specific storm? How do we pre-plan? Yeah, well, you know, we are, you, you're exactly right. We are very blessed people with uh, some great technology. And uh, the, the, the weather, the National Weather Service, they monitor weather patterns uh, all over the world. Uh, but they know that, particularly for the East Coast, the, the threat being hurricanes, they watch the systems as they, the, the weather systems as they come off the African coast. And as they see thunderstorms develop out off the African coast and they start organizing into a, uh, an, into a tropical uh, system, they really start watching those closely. So we can have, we can have uh, several hours of, um, of, of advanced warning for those types of storms. Um, when, when the storms uh, start approaching the Caribbean islands, uh, they really start narrowing the focus of, of watching those storms. They'll actually fly uh, hurricane watch planes through those uh, storms to really get some specific readings on wind speeds and, and uh, barometric pressure and things of that nature, which all, are, all indicate the strength of the storm, if you will. Uh, when the storms get about 72 hours out, uh, our area will go into what we call advisory mode. Uh, which basically is just uh, putting everybody on alert, saying that there is a system that's about 72 hours from striking. Now, obviously, the speed of the storm can slow down, it can speed up and change that rather quickly. Um, and then within about 48 hours of potential landfall, we'll go into a hurricane watch. Typically, this puts the hurricane pretty close between the Caribbean and uh, Florida Panhandle. And uh, it will go into a warning at 36 hours of potential landfall, uh, and that is they, they fully expect that we're going to have some effects of the, of the storm. Even if it just brushes by the coast, we still will have some effects of the storm. And in reality, the coastlines are already feeling effects of the storm from heavy surfs. Well, I remember the last storm that came through Irene, we had uh, substantial advance notice. And I know that the winds here in the Jacksonville area did not get over, I believe, 70, 75 miles mm -hmm. an hour. But in that storm, we had tremendous damage. Mm -hmm. And before we talk about the damage, let's spend just a minute talking about your own personal plan that every citizen in the Jacksonville, Onslow County area needs to be preparing, their hurricane plan. Talk us through that. Absolutely. Uh, every, every person who's in a hurricane-prone area needs to have uh, a plan for evacuating their family. Um, you can imagine that with a Category 1 storm, such as Hurricane Sandy, doesn't seem as disruptive, but when you start uh, thinking about the impact of the flooding, that, that can have substantial effects. And, and typically, um, the deaths that occur during a hurricane are most, most often a result of flooding. Um, after a hurricane, this is as a result of cleanup. So there's a couple things that citizens need to consider. One is, again, like I said, an evacuation plan. Uh, when, the, when the authorities in the area uh, recommend that citizens evacuate, they need to evacuate. Uh, there's a difference between mandatory and, and uh, general evacuation orders, uh, but when the authorities recommend that they uh, evacuate, they need to get out of the area. There's, I was going to say, now when you talk about the difference between mandatory and just recommended, uh, is a mandatory evacuation something where we actually have the police power to actually force families to leave their homes? We could. We could do that. If, if, if it is very necessary for us to do that, we could. Um, but that would be only in extreme circumstances. And, and it's something that we have to evaluate as we move forward. I mean, there may be parts of the city that we mandatorily have to evacuate. Um, and, and if that's the case, then it's going to be after con careful consideration, and it's going to be a decision that the uh, that the mayor is is going to to make and move down to the police department. Now, when we actually get into the hurricane, the mayor is one is one of the people who is important in the process. And Absolutely, the mayor has to actually officially designate that we are now into a storm situation. Yes, his is a proclamation that is a An emergency declaration. Emergency of emergency. declaration. Yeah. Now, once the mayor and council, or the mayor makes that proclamation, the elected officials really have no role in helping the city through. That's one of the blessings of living in a quality community the size of Jacksonville, is there's a professional staff. 
But even with a professional staff, as the manager, for example, I'm really not in charge. We turn those things over to professionals who have extra degree of training like you, Spencer. <laughs> so you, know, you become yeah. our emergency management operator. And with that, we activate literally dozens and dozens of people. So let's spend a minute talking about, again, the preparation that the city does from roughly 24 hours out when we see that the storm is most probably going to be coming to Jacksonville, and then walk us through what the city does in preparing, in going through the storm, and then when we're ready to to release the declaration and open the city back up, the curfew. Actually, you know, and it goes back to the comments you made before about before the storm, before hurricane season, season even hits, we start uh, reviewing policies and procedures with our personnel because we know we're in a hurricane prone area. We're subject to have one. So it's best to review those uh, policies and procedures before we act, the actual event occurs. So that's one step, one level of preparation. The second level is is uh, when, the, when we actually see the storms coming, we start going through processes of checking our equipment, making sure you know, the chainsaws are sharp, that they're fueled up, the generators are fueled up, that they run. And you know, they do those things on a day-to-day -day basis anyway, but we just take an extra measure of uh, checking equipment, making sure they're operating like they're supposed to. The other thing is that we, we try and have the emergency personnel an opportunity to take care of their families because uh, when an emergency happens in our local area, we've got to have emergency responders that operate here. And they don't have time to take, care, take, take their families away from the area or take them up towards Raleigh or the western part of the state or, or elsewhere. So we have to give them an opportunity sometime before the storm hits so that they can take care of their own uh, issues at home. The other thing is that uh, as, the, as the storm gets even closer, uh, within about that 36 hour range, we start developing uh, alternative staffing arrangements because the, the magnitude of the damages and the emergencies that occur during hurricanes, we have to staff up our resources, so to speak. So we go from, for the fire department, for example, we go from a 24-48 type shift where there's three shifts working to where we go 12 hours on, 12 hours off for two shifts working. So we just basically split a shift of personnel and divide them amongst the other two. That's typically what we do. Now, one thing you mentioned was that uh, some personnel, just city people, but also just residents of the community, may decide that they want to try to relocate. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about uh, relocating versus local shelters. Uh, Mike, I know that we have a great relationship with the school board. Uh, where correct. are most of our shelters provided, though? Or is it through well, the school system? It is through the school system, different schools. Uh, it, within the city, we use the commons as, as one of the shelters. And we, we, we actually assign an officer there, and they have emergency power, they have food, they have, uh, so, th so they're well equipped to shelter people during any type of emergency. But let, let me go back just a minute to when um, Chief Lee was talking about preparing. You know, when you talk about that 36 hours, that's the time that people should also be preparing. So, you know, if you have a generator, you wanna make sure that it has fuel, you wanna have extra fuel, you wanna have extra water, you want to have extra food, at least 72 hours, especially if you're going to stay in place. Now, is that 72 hours for your family, or is that 72 hours worth of supplies for each person? That's for each person. Okay. Each person in there should have at least 72 hours, because it, it could take up to three days, depending on power, depending on whatever that type of emergency is. So those are things, when we're preparing, that, that, uh, that a family should be preparing for as well. So the, it's, it's very important for you to be prepared as well. And just like that decision that you're going to make, whether you're going to stay in your home or whether you're going to shelter with us or whether you're going to go to the western part of the state, those decisions need to be made within that 70, before that 72 hours. Because if you try to leave, you know, like when, when, it's, when it already hits, you know, you, you're kind of wasting your time because if you go out 24 I mean, there are low-lying areas there, and in, in some of the hurricanes, we've actually been cut off going north. So going north 24 to 40, you might not be able to get there if you try to, if you try to leave right before the wind or right before the hurricane hits. And depending on how fast it moves, it, you, may have, you may have some difficulties there. So that important time, that 72 hours, is a really important time to make a decision what you're going to do. Are you going to stay at your home? Are you going to stay with us in the shelter? 
or are you going to leave and go somewhere uh, toward the western part of the state? You know, one of the things going back again to uh, the decision to relocate, we do have to remember that these are massive storms. Yes. And if you wait until the storm winds are already up 25, 30 miles an hour and you say, well, I'm going to go ahead and try to drive to Raleigh. Well, guess what? That storm may just beat you to Raleigh. Yes. And that brings up an important component about the setting up of curfews and when do we actually close the road systems and advise people not to travel. So first of all, let's talk about curfews and also the difference between maybe the county EOC curfew versus the city's curfew. Well, the city's curfew is designed just for the city. The county's curfew is designed for the entire county. Now remember, part of our county has a lot more water uh, and a lot more coast than we have inside the city limits. So ours is designed for the city. And the curfew is designed to keep people off the road because, you know, when we have hurricanes, we have wind damage, we have down power lines, we have trees, we have water, and our city crews are trying to clean that, that, that stuff up. We're trying to get the lights back in, in working order. And we have generators for each of those intersections, but that takes some time, and we can't do that when it's raining. So. The curfew is designed to get us ready so that people can get out again. And that's why we encourage people not to be on the roads. A lot of times you might see the sun come out at a particular time. It may be just the eye of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. Or it may be that the hurricane's over but the waters haven't subsided yet or there's still active live power lines all over the highway, which can be very dangerous to drive over or to stop. So. The curfew is, is designed for your protection. Even though you say, oh, you know, it's, it's nice out here, we, we, we think we can, that's not really the time. The time is to listen and, and wait until we've called the curfew off because at that particular time, we feel like the, the roadways are safe, that people can utilize them in a very safe manner. You know, Spencer, when we talk about uh, the preparation, many of us just assume that our telephone is still gonna work, mm -hmm. that our cable is still gonna be there, that our electricity is still going to be there. And the reality is all of that could be taken out by just one power line going down, knocking down a transformer in your neighborhood. Let's go back and talk again about the, the kit as far as the generator where it should be placed. Because okay. unfortunately, if you place it in the wrong place, you could be jeopardizing your family. That's so when exactly it comes wrong. to a generator, where should people place those? Well. I can tell you where they shouldn't place them for certain, and that's any enclosed space, whether it be a garage, even if the door's open, don't, they shouldn't place their generators in a the garage. They should be placed outside the home, somewhere where it can be sheltered from some of the wind and rain, but they do need to be placed outside of the home. Would you recommend that during the storm itself that people would actually run the generator, or is it better to simply wait until the storm has passed and then run your generator? Well, you know, they can run their generator if, if and when the power cuts off, but uh, there's a couple things they need to be cautious of. One is uh, if, they, if they have a generator that they self-install, they want to be certain that they're not backfeeding power through the power lines because there have been injuries to our, our line maintenance folks in that regard from working on power lines thinking that they were de-energized when in actuality there was a generator down the street running that was backfeeding in that line. So let me see if I've got this picture. Normally, I've got the electricity coming in from the big lines and it's coming into my meter. Yes. The meter is spinning as fast as it goes for air conditioning and all of that, and you know, life is good. Suddenly, the power line is down, but when I set up my generator, are you saying that that electricity not only comes to my TV and to my air conditioner, but it has the potential to going back out on the line? It absolutely can, and in fact, there are uh, electrical codes that require certain measures to be in place to prevent that. Uh, uh, an emergency transfer of power switch should be installed for most permanently installed generators. Now if, uh, if the homeowners, if our citizens just have drop cords run into a lamp, to a refrigerator, and things of that nature, there shouldn't be any problems. But if they actually have the generator tied into the electrical system of the home, okay. meaning the meter base, the breaker panel, things of that nature, that's certainly something they need to consider. The other thing that we have to remember is that these generators run off of gasoline. Yes. 
And just because the storm passes doesn't mean that the fueling points around the community have gasoline. That's right. So what do you recommend as far as how many gallons? I have no idea whether a generator burns a gallon an hour. Do you have any advice for people with generators? Well, you know, it's really, they just need to, they really need to be familiar with the make and model of generator they have. Uh, if they have the owner's manual for the generator, it should provide them some idea how much fuel over what time period it burns based on the recommended load or the maximum load that it would operate. Uh, and best guess, I would say I would have at least maybe uh, an extra five gallons or extra 10 gallons of fuel, depending on the size of the generator. And again, if you're going to have that, we definitely don't recommend you store it inside your house. No. The generator needs to be outside, the yes. fuel supply needs to be kept yes. outside. Now, going back to the process of eliminating or or calling the curfew off. The mayor has the authority to establish the curfew. The mayor can, can rescind the curfew. But again, Mike, I know in Irene, one of the challenges we had was that uh, even before, because the sun came out, like you said, it got very beautiful, we had people who became tourists. They wanted to go out and see how much damage was there. Uh, the danger of that really is that you're putting yourself in peril by a number of ways. And let's review those again. Well, for one, there's the water. I mean, you know, the, if there's flooding or something like that, I mean, th that's the potential. The electricity, because a lot of times the power lines are down. The, li the fact that the lights aren't working, you know, you come to a light and it's not working, you know, sometimes people get confused. They may go through the light. They may have an accident. So, I mean, that, that can be a particular problem. And especially in the, in the very near aftermath of the storm, you know, we're trying to establish, we're trying to establish the roads open up. We're trying, the electric company is out there to trying to, to get the lights back in place. We have officers who are responding to different types of emergencies. So we may not have enough officers and enough generators to cover every single light in the city. So, you know, that's why we, we ask people to refrain from coming out right away. And that's why, you know, the sun might be out, and it might be out for an hour or two, and, and you're still under the curfew. That's why, because we haven't, we haven't made sure that the city is safe so people can get out there and be safe when they're traveling to, to check on their family or go to a store or whatever they may be doing, check on their business, whatever, whatever it may be. You know, one of the things that's interesting about uh, a hurricane, especially if you've not been through it, is what I'll call the inconsistency of the storm event. Mm -hmm. Certainly when you're right at the eye wall, you know, the winds can continue to blow consistently very heavily. But as the storm is approaching you or as it is leaving our community, there are what we call bands. Mm -hmm. And Spencer, talk to us about what those bands are and why you don't want to get out in between the bands. Yes, uh, it can be very deceiving uh, because there can be a, a tremendous amount of space between each band of, of showers and thunderstorms. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is, is that uh, hurricanes also spawn tornadoes, which are very unpredictable. It's very difficult. Our, our, our meteorological uh, folks have, have come a long way uh, since 30 years ago, but but still, they're very difficult to to master. So the the all the hazards that are associated with hurricanes, that space in between the rain bands can can actually lead you to believe that maybe the hurricane's gone. And uh, when in act uh, in actuality, it's not. It's far from it. And uh, you still have perhaps even the worst part of the storm coming. The, you know, Chief had mentioned about the eye, the eye of the storm being the same thing. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, the sun shining brightly and everything looks peaceful and calm until 30 minutes, perhaps an hour later, the other part of the eye wall comes through and uh, you're, you're really getting hit again. Well, you know, at the end of the day, the city is very blessed to have you two gentlemen leading us and the teams that you have of dedicated public servants. The mayor and council are committed to continuing high quality services in every area, especially in police and fire. So as we close out this session of the moment of the manager, I would like to recommend folks visit us on our websites. They can get additional information. Also, they're certainly free to come down to City Hall or to set up appointments with any of us to get further personal information. Absolutely. The most important thing, though, is this. Never assume that you're going to be safe. Always have an evacuation plan. Yes. 
Make sure that you have all of your medicines, that you have food supply adequate for a 72-hour period, mm -hmm. and that you stay in communication with other people. Let them know where you're going to be so that if you're going to be going to a shelter, or if you're going to be going to Raleigh, or if you're just going to stay at home, somebody needs to know what your hurricane plan is. Yes. Well, again, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being with us here on A Moment with the Manager. Yes, thank sir. You.